let's get started i want to do i want to try to do a quick video and quick for me is probably going to be an hour um but I, I don't really know how long this is going to drag out but specifically with regard to this video i want to do something on this sort of narrative that gets created around separation and integration as far as the historical context of what is actually happening on the ground as far as fighting for civil rights as far as fight, fighting for black liberation um over the years okay so what i want to start to do in this video is i want to start out with going all the way back for i guess the first couple of generations after slavery you're going to have a contention between booker t washington and Du Bois, and then you're going to have a continued contention between Marcus Garvey and Du Bois, which is going to continue um, and kind of evolve into a contention that ends up being between the allies or backers or supporters or the people, you know, behind movements associated with Martin Luther King, and then with the Nation of Islam specifically and Malcolm X. But when I leave, you remember I said with the last word a revolutionary so the way i want to start this is by going all the way back like i said to the boys and booker t washington and by the end of this i'm hoping to show how this narrative created around separation and integration is basically something that was created by entities that had kind of a nefarious relationship towards black liberation basically to try to create um discontent and uh kind of like cointel pro type operations against the black community and i think that the same could be said about the creation of this as the historical context because it never really existed it never really popped up it was never really an issue yet but when created by entities that I feel did not have the best interests of the black community and were specifically trying to uh, thwart the progress of the black community. So I want to start out with, um, I want to start out by bringing up my screen. Um, and I want to go to the issue of the history. And in a document that I created um, called Those Leaders Targeted by the Government for Political Activity, including those who either as informants, agents, or unwittingly worked against the interests of the black community. But I'm going to scroll all the way down to the bottom of this where it deals with specifically Booker T. Washington, Du Bois, Marcus Garvey, and others. Um, the original contention between Du Bois and Booker T. Washington is extremely important for understanding the basic trajectory of what happened in the history of black liberation struggle or civil rights movement or however you want to categorize it. And what you're going to see is that this has, was always a contention, not between people who were for separation and then people who were for integration. It was a contention between those who were wanting to radically fight for their rights in ways that were more extreme, particularly in ways that were more anti-capitalist, anti-capitalist and anti-imperialist. That is the fundamental distinction and the fundamental, fundamental radical trajectory of the history was between those who were extremely radical in their anti-capitalism and uh, anti-imperialism and in their fight for civil rights specifically with regard to the United States that's where the integration thing gets brought up right because there are particular people who were working to a particular interest who obviously did not want to give black people full rights within the United States so let me start let me go back to my screen okay and I want to bring up souls of black folk um, of Booker T. Washington and others. Now, this is the boy's personal opinion. But what you're going to see by this is how he particularly framed the issue of disagreement with uh, Booker T. Washington. 
Okay. Okay. Now it's going to it's going to go through some stuff. But it's going to say in answer to this, it has been claimed that the Negro can survive only through submission. Mr. Washington distinctly asked that black people give up at least for the present three things. First, political power. Second, insistence on civil rights. And third, higher education of Negro youth and concentrate their energies on industrial education, accumulation of wealth. Okay. Now, it goes on to say um, that you do not blaming this on uh, Washington specifically, but says that um, these things, these in these in these years, there have occurred the disenfranchisement of the Negro. So we're talking about you know stripping of voting rights, basically during the late uh, in the turn of the century, basically into the twentieth uh, century. Um, I mean, like the historical context of that was that. You know, obviously, during Reconstruction, blacks had a lot of voting rights. They were voting. They were participating in government. And then there was kind of a white supremacist reaction after the end of slavery. Um, you know, what we, what we consider black codes uh, today, what we consider, you know, basically the period of Reconstruction and uh, anti-black violence that happened, the KKK, uh, red shirts, um, these white leagues that were created to basically form uh, to basically commit coups against the southern governments that were black led okay and okay steady withdrawal of aid from institutions of higher education and training so what that was was specifically a disagreement about um how they were going to fight for their rights so this wasn't a disagreement about um this wasn't a disagreement about you know integration or separation now that I mean, at that point, when people frame it, when people frame it like that, um, to a certain degree, it's kind of, you know, ridiculous because during that time, the, it was all it was already segregated. So how during a time of segregation are you even going to try to attempt to articulate the issue as between integration? Let's bring in a today's mindset to a struggle that was happening back then, right? So during a time frame where they were literally setting black people on fire, mass shootings, lynchings, uh, just basically it, it was kind of like open season, um, no, no prosecutions. I mean, sort of like today uh, where, you know, black people can get killed by police or whatever without prosecutions. But this was on a, a large wide scale throughout the south basically um type of behavior which um if you read the paper that i did on specifically on history of anti uh, black violence or if you just go through the history of reconstruction era violence you will see a lot of a lot of what you know took place during that time um so um specifically it, it kind of really doesn't make sense to consider the issue from the perspective of integration versus separation then because they were literally fighting, you know, for their lives. Uh, people were trying to survive. Um, they were trying to escape sharecropping. They were trying to escape prison as far as um, convict leasing was concerned. And, and the same was the case when, um, for example, Marcus Garvey came to the United States. Okay. So, there was the issue of Booker T. Washington, first of all. Booker T. Washington had what they called the Atlanta Compromise, where he felt that um, the better way to go was basically to kind of, you know, not fight for civil rights. Even though, probably in his mind, he didn't... Oh, maybe always agree with that because th th there's been you know rumors cases of him actually you know behind the scenes doing a little bit more than he spoke publicly but he at least felt that you know that we shouldn't as violently or as publicly fight for civil rights um and vocally and that we should concede some to the south and basically northern 
industrialist business owners by foregoing private, I mean, not private, but um, higher education for basically trades. Um, and Du Bois obviously disagreed. That's where the talented 10th particularly came into play, where Du Bois felt that we need intellectual black leaders, that we need people to be educated to be able to come to the next generation and say, to lay out, you know, this is the path. This is what we need to do. This is what we need to fight for. This is this is our struggles. This you could lead. You could be the, the next leadership class, um, and you know, widespread education. Whereas, uh, particularly Washington and the Tuskegee Institute was more uh, developed toward you know trades and trying to g gain wealth that way. Which is not like that anybody actually disagreed as far as um like most people today would not disagree with the notion that people should participate in trades um what it specifically would be the major disagreement which as it was back then was with the idea for not fighting immediately for civil rights and particularly if you want to look at, look back at it um think of what 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 the consequences could have been it preempted by you know several decades the civil rights movement happened imagine if what happened in the 60s happened in 1900 for a minute just think about what if what happened in the 60s happened in the 1900 how would that be different but you had a prominent black leader being able to be propped up and that's the problem because white america will always look for a black leader that they could prop up and say hey look at this guy He's telling y'all, hey, get out of the streets. Don't fight for your rights. Don't fight against lynchings. Don't fight against, you know, violence. Just go to go to your trade schools. Try to build, you know, this immediate amount of wealth. Which if we learn anything from the ADL, ADOS movement, um, which one thing that particularly did you have to say that they've done well on was saying that you have to put politics. You have to put politics first. Because no, no amount of economic solution is going to work if all they have to do is come and kill you and take your money, right? And you have no political recourse to go to. You have, you have no legal structure to go to. You have no judges to go to. You know, have no, no recourse whatsoever, just like during the Tulsa riots, which coincidentally happened during, right, right, actually right during and after this era. So, um. And that kind of rolls specifically back into the issue of what happened with Marcus Garvey. Okay. These were back-to-back -back cases. Okay. So um, the dispute, I mean, uh, Booker T. Washington died in, I think, 1915. Okay. If I could go back. Yes. Booker T. Washington died November 14th, 1915. And before he left the United States, I mean, before um, Garvey came to the United States, um, before he left for the United States, he had conversations with Booker T. Washington as an influence, as someone he wanted to meet up with. Before he actually got here, um, Booker T. Washington had already passed away. Um, and we're talking like months. So they're having conversations where um, Garvey's like, hey, I'm coming to the United States. Uh, let's meet up. Let's uh, talk about, you know, how I'm influenced by your teachings, blah, blah, blah. And right when he comes to the United States, so the United States from 1916. So basically within, you know, months, not even a complete year, I'm sure, or I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure within the time frame of Booker T. Washington dying under strange circumstances, did Garvey come to the United States? Okay. And a particular interest here with Garvey coming to the United States was that Booker T. Washington's death was sort of suspicious. Um, it was something that people questioned for a while regarding um, the circumstances. Um, you'll see here in my notes, um, I should have a link to the death of Booker T. Washington. Okay, I'm going to go to this link real quick. 
And um, one of the disputes about his death was particularly the cause of death. And you're going to um, remember that um, the Tuskegee Institute also happened to be the place where the um, the experiments happened, the Tuskegee experiments with regard to um, the syphilis, right? Where they, gave, where they basically, black people got syphilis, they gave them syphilis or whatever, and it went untreated, um, basically as part of a government experimentation. They were never properly treated. Um, penicillin, penicillin was out to treat it. It was never properly treated. People, you know, died basically during this. Um, well, um, his cause of death was questioned with regard to if it had anything to do with syphilis when Booker T. Washington died, which is kind of coincidental. Um, he had symptoms of, you know, fatigue and other things that were symptoms of syphilis. It was concluded, you know, later on that maybe, maybe not, that it had something to do with it, but that's always an important thing to look at with regard to his death. But he dies, um, and almost immediately after, Marcus Garvey comes to the United States and founds the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League, also known as the uh, UNIA ACL. Okay. Now, one thing to remember about this league, specifically, is that originally this was a highly left leaning league. Okay. So I want to post a video. I want to post a clip from a video of Democracy Now! where uh, Marcus Garvey's son actually said one of the reasons that Marcus Garvey actually stayed in the United States was because it was left leaning, because it was communist, that Marcus Garvey wanted to try to raise specific elements. And, and um, they. they... As we mentioned, the, the agricultural south, the industrial north, the conditions under which people live. And this was when? This would have been, um, again, from 1916 to 1917. This was when he did that. And then his plan was still to go back um, um, uh, to Jamaica, although he established a branch of the UNIA uh, in New York. But again, the politics of the situation. Um, Every time he developed the organization to the extent where he thought he could leave, then there were communists and there were other people who were trying to take over the organization as, as a black organization. And he ended up being requested to stay, and he stayed, and that became the headquarters. So if you remember what I said earlier, particularly in the United States struggle, I mean, this is all the way through, anti-communism was a primary, primary target against the black community. Okay, and actually during Garvey's t uh, um, time in the United States, when the government, I mean, because obviously they're anti-black as well, when they looked into him, one of the black, uh, um, I think it was officer um, and part of intelligence, they asked him to, hey, go take, check this guy out. Um, I think his name was um, Loving. Um, it was something similar. He's probably on this. But anyway, they sent him and said, hey, go take a look at this guy. Garvey, tell, him, tell us basically what he's all about. You know, we want to look at a way, you know, it, um, to target basically immigrants, um, most of whom were, um, yeah, Walter Loving. He's on here. Um, retired military intelligence officer had this back black informants uh, to UNIA meetings. Loving concluded that Garvey's speeches could consider seditious only during the war, which was ending. Um, like Loving, uh, uh, like Scott, okay. Loving was a black official uh, assisting U.S. military intelligence, okay. But, so he basically concluded that, you know, some of his language could be con considered, you know, problematic during the war times, but that otherwise there was nothing really that they could go off of as far as, you know, getting him out of the country, as far as targeting him. Whereas, you know, other leaders like later on, especially who were targeted by McCarthyism, uh, Ferdinand Smith, um, Claudia, um, Claudia, I think Claudia Jones, uh, I think that's her name, uh, 
um, we get Claudia Jones, um, a communist, uh, was targeted and, you know, kicked out of the country for being communist, whereas Marcus Garvey was, you could argue, anti-communist. So um, during this time frame, Marcus Garvey comes to the United States, starts the UN, UNIA, and particularly this was the exact same time um, where, like I said, Booker T. Washington died, but it was also the time when the NAACP was being founded, okay? And where the boys actually moved to New York, um, as an office they had in New York, to actually uh, head the division, you know, writing the, um, like, his involvement with the crisis and stuff like that. So it basically became a sort of rival, a rival um, organization. And particularly, um, one thing that you'll notice is there was a falling out a little bit with for you know between um Ida B. Wells and Du Bois during this time period. So uh Ida B. Wells, um, who actually should have really been an uh, original member in a large part of the NWCP, um was another individual who were who was part of the um UNIA early on was Briggs. And Briggs um specifically was um a radical um basically communist socialist during this time period right okay these were people who had falling outs with garvey specifically i mean according to marcus garvey's son one of the reasons we stayed in the country for a extended period of time was to try to end this element um to try to end this element within the uh, UNIA, right? Um, it says right here, Briggs uh, Marx's views applied to separate uh, to a separatist government caused a rift with Marcus Garvey, um, the founder. Um, while the uh, um, post of Garvey's Nazi moves to market, Marxist uh, did not view Africa for Africa as an invitation to capitalist development. Boy, um, Briggs wrote socialism and communism were. Um, were in practical application in Africa for centuries before they were even advanced um, in, as theories in the European world, right? Which that's a, that's a, I mean, today that's almost like, you know, common theme among uh, black socialists. Um, um, certain people from a historical perspective always viewed that, um, uh, you know, anti-capitalism was, you know, something that was, you know, already within the culture of Africa. Um, as far as how African culture differ from, differs from culture within the United States, right? So um, Garvey uh, founds this organization and it's particularly, like like I said, or like, like was pointed out, had a separatist um, back to Africa type of angle. And one of the things that uh, I like to point out historically is that it wasn't the first time that that was ever brought up. It wasn't, um, it was really even the second time that that was ever brought up. Um, this was an idea that was continually pushed, but the first time that it was pushed, surprisingly enough, was, um, or not, maybe not the first time, but predominantly throughout the early uh, 19th century, the separatism was pushed specifically um, to try to get black people out of Africa. I mean, uh, back out of the United States to Africa, the Liberia, um, the Liberia movement, uh, colonization movement, right? So um, I'll post another um, clip um, once I edit this that you'll see specifically how um, Du Bois felt that during this particular time, a lot of black people, um, you know, once they, like, you know, Frederick Douglass type generation um, and um, people like... Uh, Alexander Cromwell um, and others who might have, particularly Alexander Cromwell and others who might have originally been up with the idea of going back to Africa to Liberia or something else, ended up um, sort of going against the movement once they realized that, you know, it could be used as a scheme to just get more intelligent, more affluent blacks to, you know, go back to Africa, like seek refuge away from, you know, what's happening in the United States so they could basically, you know, further institutionalized blacks through slavery originally 
And I guess afterwards, you have to be looking at things like uh, Jim Crow segregation. In the earlier days, in the uh, latter part of the 18th century, in the beginning of the 19th century, the Negroes in America considered themselves African. They called their organizations African. There were African clubs. There was the uh, African Methodist Episcopal Church and the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church and so forth. Then there arose a movement among the whites to help them return to Africa. And the Negroes suddenly realized that what they were doing was to get rid of the free Negroes and of the more intelligent Africans so that they could have only Negro slaves here. So there came a tremendous uh, revulsion of feeling. And from the middle of the 19th century on, uh, there was one thing that the American Negroes were determined not to do, and that was to return to Africa. And anybody that talked about return to Africa was uh, not in uh, good order. And the like, um, basically. So they kind of rejected it, and it c came, you know, basically simultaneously with seeing themselves as more American, they started rejecting a lot of these ideas. And it was Marcus Garvey um, and others, but Marcus Garvey most prominently brought this idea back to the United States. And also, surprisingly or not surprisingly, depending on how you want to look at it, um, if I go back to my notes, I posted the link to how Du Bois felt at the time, which obviously Du Bois changed his tune a little bit after, so like kind of, like almost kind of like just violently and like angrily going after um, Marcus Garvey for what he felt he was doing um, against the black community, basically, during this time period. How he felt that um, specifically um, he wrote in Lunatic or Traitor. So um, the boys kind of later on, um, if you want to read the article, you could take a look at this link. Uh, that a crisis on, on Google Books, but um, specifically, um, Du Bois felt at that time that um, Marcus Garvey was doing a lot to team up with white supremacists, um, kind of against the programs. But at the same time, because you got to look at both angles, right? The NAACP, Garvey might have definitely been right that the NAACP was rather more mainstream liberal right but like i said his story was never between separation and race it's always between liberal elements versus radical elements right so he was right definitely 100 percent marcus garvey was correct and a lot of people saw the appeal of the communist appeal that was originally with the unia and that's why it kind of blew up at the beginning um but Marcus Garvey fought against that in a UNIA, right? For a more separatist angle. He called um, socialism and communism um, particularly more kind of white things, or considered them that in particular uh, times in his life. So Du Bois kind of went on to um, sort of kind of go back on this a little bit, like as far as uh, maybe not seeing Marcus Garvey as sort of the disruptive as he did when he was pretty angry in this moment, like after he got deported and stuff like that. But I mean, the critique really still stands. Um, the boys probably didn't think or wouldn't have thought like people think about him today. Right. So the boys gave the type of respect to where he didn't come fully with, with the notion that um, Marcus Garvey was just a traitor. Right. But, but people today, will 100% go at Du Bois and say that he was Boulé, um, that he was an elitist, that, um, you know, he was, you know, kind of, you know, in with the white, the, the white crowd, with, you know, his white Jewish friends people refer to, right? But they won't look into elements of whether or not Garvey was, who was actually a Freemason, um, was actually considered... Um, you know, by certain sources to be a Freemason coming to the United States with particular interests that also just happen to overlap with, you know, a KKK agenda. Um, and 
an agenda specifically, which again, like I said earlier in the video, imagine if the civil rights movement had happened earlier, right? Or the black liberation struggle, the black liberation movement, thing like the Panthers. So when I say civil rights movement, sometimes I, I connect those two together, which obviously some people seem as being a lot different. But um, imagine if it happened a lot earlier. Imagine if that radical communist, like, you know, Black Panther code and conduct got started a lot earlier, right? Because it, it took off with the UNIA. Originally, that's what it was about. I mean, originally, this particular members that I showed you had disagreements with um, Garvey. Um, that's what it was about. But Garvey made it more of a separatist movement. He made it less of a communist movement. He made it less of a radical movement, right? See, that's the, that's the particular point that you have to understand about the, the issue between integration and separation. The most important thing, if anything from this video, if I might just cut this down to this, this one thing to remember, is the issue between the integration and separation for the radicals. Because particularly, if you frame the issue as an anti-black, anti-white issue, but you don't frame the anti-black, anti-white issue as an issue of capitalism, as an issue of empire, as an issue of colonization, as an issue of white expansion of wealth, particularly within a capitalist dynamic, you're kind of missing the point, right? They didn't wake up one day and it's like, hey, you know, let's just go target black people, right? They said, hey, let's build this system with blacks at the bottom through enslavement, through the slave trade, and let's continue this throughout to maintain our status within a capitalist framework at the top the elite level, right? So let me go back to the boys, okay? And specifically, we're gonna go from the boys to King, and I'll show the connection here. Um, so towards the end of his life, um, Du Bois became more communist, right? Which people, some people actually pointed out or try to point out falsely or maybe kind of confused that um, Du Bois, oh, he picked up on certain things that maybe Garvey originally had um, at his part of his platform, but Du Bois, no. Du Bois was um, a follower of uh, Alexander Crummel. He was, had a Pan-African uh, conference, you know, in like the 1900 the early 1900, like we're talking about 19, like the early 1900s, not all the way after Garvey came, because after Garvey came, he did actually the first Pan African Congresses he was a part of after Garvey, but already he was already part of Pan African con uh, con Conferences um, before that. Um, he was already um, in Souls of Black Folk promoting pro black ideas, pro black history, pro black, pro -black teachings pro-black education, um, pro-black community stuff from the beginning. There was, there was never any discrepancies or changes with regard to how pro-black he was. Uh, as far as integration, like I said, that was never an issue. The issue that black people was getting set on fire, black people was getting lynched, black people was getting shot, mowed down, thrown out of government, told that they weren't allowed to have any rights whatsoever. Right? So that's what he was fighting against. Um, for rights, right? Like it's called a civil rights movement, but a lot of people pretend like it's not called a civil rights movement. It's called the, the civil integration movement, and it whatever it was, right? So during his later life, he became um, a reader of Marx um, and Black Reconstruction. It references Marx. It basically is basically a Marxist analysis of Reconstruction and basically a way of framing Reconstruction specifically with regard to Black. Um, as a black liberation struggle, as black people gain their own independence and rights and basically running some of the best government uh, structures that ever existed within the United States in the South, uh, founding black education in this, I mean, education for everybody in the South, right? Because one of the primary contentions of the civil rights movement was the, um, the ending of, um, well, the um, existence of um, separation in schools, but it wasn't separation was the problem versus integration. Problem was that black schools got separated, but they took all the resources, right? So black, black people started the schools in the South, but then when they broke the schools apart, um, 
and said that, you know, hey, white kids got to go to separate schools, which originally black people didn't really make the distinction. They said white people can go to separate schools if they want to, but we're building back, we're, we're building schools, we're building schools for everybody. And all these years of white people not want, rich white people not wanting any of these poor white people to get educated, not any one of their own people to get educated, um, except for by, you know, elitist standards, um, they came and ended that. And when they, uh, white supremacists came in and kind of took over the system again, they kept the education, but they said black people got to go to separate schools with no resources. So they pay taxes or whatever else they got to do, but um, they're going to separate schools. And not only are they going to separate schools, they're going to separate schools specifically without resources. Okay, you get the hand-me-down books. You get no pool. You go to the local creek if you want to go swimming. You don't get a pool. You're not getting any, you know, state-of-the-art facilities. Because obviously, if you if you separate schools, one of the things you have to realize is you have to spend twice as amount of money on the schools. Um, you can't, like, accumulate everybody's money to go together to, you know, build programs. So towards the end of his life, he started becoming more Marxist. Um, he started, he was already international in his framework, but he started petitioning. Once the Because you have to keep in mind that the UN didn't exist back then, right? Um, the League of Nations and stuff. But after this World War II specifically, that's when the UN starts coming into play and they start petitioning. The National Negro Congress petitions first, I think, then the WCCP and Du Bois petition. Then we had the We Charge Genocide petition. Then after, you know, during the 60s, that's when Malcolm X starts bringing up the issue again. So that's how we kind of fast forward to the, um, to King and Malcolm specifically. Okay. Um, so we're at a state where um, we're in the 1950s and black people don't have the rights that they were fighting for since the end of Reconstruction, right? They got, and if you look at that, you're looking at multiple decades of setbacks, right? Originally, it was Booker T. Washington coming up to the, after he dies in 15, the 15, so basically from zero to 15, to about 15 year period or so, um, you know, NAACP is just now starting to take over the ideas, right, of um, how black people ought to approach liberation. Um, and Booker T. Washington's ideas start going out of style. And he passes away. Marcus Garvey comes on the scene, right? And he, his, you know, movement explodes with young, vibrant radicals that then go um, specifically into a way that's more separatist and kind of the radical elements kind of get shoved to the side, right? Um, but then Garvey gets kicked out of the country later on. That's like the late, like uh, 1927, 25, 27, where he starts, you know, going and leaving the country. And then, so you're talking about the 1930s, right? And then, you had the McCarthyism, so you had this huge anti-communist swarm, and plus you're talking about World War I, and you're talking about the Depression, right? Then you're talking about World War II. So at the end of World War II, now we're talking going into the 50s. That's when things could start started again. But you had a huge setback in between World War One. See, if up to World War One and up to World War One, we wouldn't have had them setbacks. That's what you have to think about what could have happened, right? So during this time, I'm gonna go back to my sheet of list of targets, and what you want to see is I cover basically McCarthyism and Cointel Pro in here. That's the two main issues. So what you're going to see as is at a particular point. McCarthyism loses a Supreme Court battle, okay? Because so basically they hold. Um, now I doubt I'm gonna be able to find it in in here, but I could probably post a link, on, if I post this on YouTube or something like that in the description, to the Supreme Court case where they actually ruled anti-communist and they said, well, hey, we're, we're dealing with the First Amendment issue here. You can't just say randomly say that you know some guy has a political affiliation, therefore we could jail them, target them, or whatever else. Also, as things started to escalate, um, COINTELPRO started kicking in as far as a transition basically from McCarthyism to a different way of targeting. Um, and basically you could say that that, that maybe started with, um, if you want to look at when it started, the kind of like the launching off of the assassination campaign was probably the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Right. 
And with the assassination of John F. Kennedy, then following that, you had Malcolm X, you had Robert Kennedy, you had uh, Martin Luther King, you had all the activists that was related from 68 on to the um, um, Black Liberation Movement, basically. Um, either Panthers or, you know, um, kind of affiliated members to BLA, whatever else you want to say, to that, right? So one of the things that um, that happened, kind of progressing, was the civil rights movement. Okay, and Martin Luther King became kind of historically, and from our today's understanding, looking back, a primary proponent, um, a primary prominent figure during this time period for civil rights. And on the flip side. In a lot of people's minds, this was Malcolm X. But particularly what I want to point out is that both Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. were part of groups of people, particularly, that did not necessarily have the best interests of the overall black community or did not specifically approach things from as radical of an agenda. That was the distinction. Malcolm and Martin probably were always radical um probably malcolm a little bit more they were probably both up there as far as you know wanting to fight for black liberation but particularly the movement that Mar um, martin luther king was a part of um kind of suppressed his his um radical you know agenda and this was partly to do with the fact that mccarthyism had just ended Right. So up to that point, they were targeting anybody who was associated with communism. Um, so up until probably about 65 ish with the Voting Rights Act and the marches. But even before that, if you want to look at the disagreements where uh, Malcolm X called, for example, the march, march, on, march on Washington, the farce on Washington and um called out what they called the big six civil rights leaders um, for basically organizing what Malcolm and others probably felt was a watered down version of what any type of march on Washington, right? If you march on Washington, it shouldn't be a happy affair. People should be afraid and they were, but they kind of organized it in such a way where particular leaders, particularly um, Bayard Rustin and, um, a Philip Randolph and others associated had kind of socialist tendencies, but they were very liberal. Thanks today, like Bernie Sanders, right? A Bernie Sanders socialist type image versus a radical Black Panther type socialist image, right? A radical like Du Bois maybe, but even like Black Panthers specifically during this time period. And, um, those particular individuals against a more radical type of movement, obviously, because this is the time we charged genocide and stuff like that was going on um, prior to that, right? And that was led, a lot of people don't know this, by the Communist Party. Um, this, there's a lot of those civil rights organizations, the National uh, uh, Negro Congress and the um, Civil Rights Congress afterwards that were petitioning, that were helping petition were, um, and obviously the boys himself was a communist, were part of the communist party, or were affiliated with individuals who had radical views, anti-capitalist views. So um, those particular elements had more of what gets called an, inter an integrationist agenda, but the integrationist agenda was never an agenda specifically to integrate. It was a co-opting of a real civil rights movement, a real black liberation movement, right? Particular interests within the government gave certain individuals leverage and cover to go in and co-opt these movements to be more peaceful, to be less critical, to be, to be able to be framed later on as, you know, kind of um, like the integrationist as they were, I mean, as it gets framed, but um, at the same time to kind of give 
a certain illusion that certain rates were being granted, right? And for specific people, you can't say that they were 100%. That's why when I call, I call this thing, I called it um, specifically um, those who maybe unwittingly, unwittingly worked because I'm pretty sure that the people in the government knew 100% that when they were passing any civil rights legislations, they were not going to be anything, right? They knew what they wanted to do was avoid a real black liberation struggle, a real anti-colonial, a real anti-imperialist, a real anti-capitalist um, revolt, a real revolution. They wanted to prevent that, and ways to do that was pretend to capitulate on certain issues regarding civil rights and using particular black leaders to say, hey, look at these guys. Look at these guys. They're saying, you know, you know, even like Martin Luther King, when people say that he was viewed as, you know, radical a troublemaker, right? Because the government specifically was saying, hey, look at these guys. Look at these black nationalists. Look at these black liberation struggle people who are out there struggling, talking about fight, you know, particularly well-off black people and well-off white people, white liberals and black, you know, moderate liberals, and conservatives who kind of had, you know, their lives together a little bit, who were a little bit older, like, hey, guys, like, you know, they, they're not, I mean, y'all's good, right? Y'all's good. Look at these, look at these, these, these black leaders. Look at these responsible black leaders who are, you know, calling for, you know, you know, peace and, you know, getting along and, you know, no, no nonviolence and um, stuff like that, right? That's what it was about. That's what it's about. And um, Malcolm X, on the other hand, was part of the Nation of Islam during this time. And the Nation of Islam specifically was basically um, a continuation, in my mind, of the um, struggle to, I mean, or effort to thwart any type of legitimate black liberation struggle, right? And Malcolm X pointed this out in his interviews. Um, specifically where he felt that when he came back from Africa, he said that, or kind of when he, when he was going and coming back to Mecca and Africa and all these other places that he wanted to, you know, come back and, you know, kind of expose Elijah Muhammad as a religious faker and uh, as a, somebody who just, you know, got black people like kind of riled up and involved in the movement, helped a lot of people, right? Helped a lot of people, you know, who might have been, you know, otherwise struggling with drugs or, you know, illicit activities or, you know, whatever type of things they were dealing with in their lives, maybe he helped them out the streets, gave him a religious framework in which to, th gave him a framework in which to, you know, kind of ground themselves and do better, right? But at the same time, what was their radical alternative? What was their radical agenda? What were they fighting for? What specific agenda did he put in place to get results done, right? Right? So whereas Martin Luther King scheduled another march on Washington, to for the poor people's campaign whereas michael max was going to go to um the united nations um and internationalize the, and basically turn into a human rights struggle what was these other groups doing and you could look at the continuation specifically from garvey to for for forward muhammad elijah muhammad and you're going to see people like new ali pop up um clarence 13 x and a lot of these people had suspicious, suspicious deaths related to, you know, being around the nation of Islam. And this is something that continued throughout. And this is something that affected Malcolm. This is something that affected, um, um, brother, um, Khalid Muhammad, right? Khalid Muhammad, um, Khalid Abdul Muhammad had similar circumstances to Malcolm X. He had a disagreement with the, the, the nation. Um, he was kicked out. He ends up dead under strange circumstances. Young, same with Malcolm, who was obviously assassinated, um, like blatantly assassinated. So coming back, you had Malcolm part of this movement, um, and he was calling out, rightfully so, on his own, as part of his own radical political agenda, calling out a lot of these other black leaders, like, hey, I mean, these people are, you know, um, saying that they're fighting for this stuff, but I mean, how hard are they really fighting? What are they really doing? Um, what are their interests, where, where they are their interests um, coming from, right? And um, towards the end of his life, um, I go to uh, Malcolm X speeches. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to um, not include this in the, in the video. Uh, 
uh, would just post a link, but I'm just going to go through this and uh, read it. This was his final interview, I think, um, where he talks about um, Elijah Muhammad. Here's what he says. I must say this concerning what Elijah Muhammad said about separation. He didn't expel separation. What he says is this, that the government should, if the government can't give complete equality right now, then the government should permit black people to go back to Africa. He did. He didn't ever say back to Africa. Elijah Muhammad has never made one statement that's pro-African, and he never has uh, in any of his speeches or written or oral said anything um, to his followers about Africa. Um, and he says, you know, what, what would he say? He's anti-African, anti-white. Uh, um, he was anti-African as he was anti-white. Uh, what about a black uh, state? Um, did you say a black state within the United in the United States? No. What he said was, uh, we should go back to our own. And he phrased it like that and spelled it out. Uh, he would have to point out some geographical area, right? And uh, would have to uh, have some consent of the people in that geographical area, obviously, which he knew he couldn't get. Um, I mean, the same could be said about Garvey. Uh, so he just kept um, elusive and said, let's go back to our own. Um, if the government wouldn't let us go back to our own, then he said we should have separation right here. But at no time did he ever uh, enter into any kind of activity or action designed to bring about any of this into existence. Um, this is Malcolm X um, again. And it was this lack of action that led many activists within the movement to become disillusioned, dissatisfied, and eventually to leave it. And um, he goes on at a specific point. Um, I doubt I'd be able to find it where he said, you know, there were certain um, individuals uh, within the black community um, that, you know, were becoming radicalized and uh, looking for an outlet. Um, Nation of Islam gave them that outlet, but sort of what I would call controlled opposition um, didn't really provide them with any type of action program other than saying this is wrong. Um, basically generalities. Um, and basically, no real concrete way out, right? So, it's to what you want to, what you want to do. What is your plan? Um, every time that people complain about stuff, um, and one of the things that Malcolm pointed out was that maybe they didn't have a plan. Maybe they they were definitely uh, co-opting a lot of uh, people who had sentiments against the United States, who had sentiments against the situation in the United States but it didn't really provide a concrete agenda, which he uh, was seeking to change with his um, trying to go to the United Nations. So um, eventually what ended up happening was King, after several civil rights legislations got passed through his working with those other black leaders, um, he realized that, um, you know, hey, that wasn't cutting it. Um, that wasn't doing it. Um, you know, we're out here marching. We're out here, you know, the legislation is getting passed. Um, so we got concrete things that we could point to. And a lot of people, I just had to say, he backtracked on a lot of it. I mean, he didn't really come fully out and say um, that, you know, it was a total mistake what he was doing. Obviously, he felt that he, they fought for legislation that was helpful. They fought for legislation that was good. They got legitimate strides forward. But the approach to the issue never really solved the concrete problem of the lack of political and economic and social um, rights that black people just lacked in the United States. So he started a movement that became more economic. He started the Poor People's Campaign. He started, you know, talking more against Vietnam. He started talking more openly um, about, you know, because he was questioned about communism, um, particularly in an interview and he came forward and he wasn't denou denouncing, um, you know, as vehemently as others might have the Soviet Union. I mean, which is, is very telling that he wasn't denouncing the Soviet Union, that he was um, basically saying, you know, people have rights to their own self-determination and basic, basically, that they have the rights, you know, that even though he might not agree specifically with every aspect of that communism, that, um, that people, um, because of his personal beliefs, that people, you know, had the right to, you know, um, 
to arrange their economies as they kind of saw fit. Well, first, let me deal with the communist problem. Uh, I think we've got to face the fact that communism is a fact uh, in the world that uh, millions and millions of people live under communist uh, regimes. And we've got to face the fact that communism is a rival uh, political system. I think it is very unfortunate that we grew up in a generation, uh, particularly, uh, particularly during the McCarthy era, when we were almost forced to have a kind of morbid, uh, almost paranoid attitude toward uh, communism. Now, it so happens that communism is a system that I disagree with philosophically. I would not prefer to live under a communist system. Uh, I happen to feel that the great moments of history have been those moments when individuals have been left free to think and, uh, and to act. And I feel that communism often stands in the way of certain First Amendment privileges that we have in America, for instance, uh, that I just couldn't adjust to. But there are other people who are communists and they live uh, in communist countries. And I think this is something that they have a right to do if they want to. The thing that keeps uh, the move in the third world toward independence is more a nationalistic surge than it is a communist surge. And when people talk about communist aggression in Vietnam, they fail to realize that there isn't a single troop in Vietnam from Russia. There isn't a single troop in Vietnam from China other than it, uh, as advisors. Now, if this is a, an attempt of communism to take over, it seems to me that Russia and China would have a lot of troops there. We are the ones that have troops 8,000 miles away, wherein they have no troops uh, in North Vietnam. The North Vietnamese don't have any particular love for China, they were once dominated uh, by China. And uh, I think we've got to see that the quest is a quest for independence, for self-determination. Uh, so um, what I want to come back to um, now is just basically in conclusion, um, back to Malcolm X, um, back to Martin Luther King, was they always felt overall, and this is one of the things that were you know, a lot of people can agree that Dr. King and Malcolm X were um, heroes, that they're legends to all people, is that they, they, their primary struggle was for black liberation, civil rights, uh, equal treatment under the law. Their primary concern was um, to gain, you know, legitimate full citizenship to, for, for black people or even if, even if, you know, insofar as they might accept it, a different alternative, it was always for it particularly, and this was all people, right? You got to keep in mind, this was a global struggle for all people, liberation of all people, right? So when they talk about Vietnam, you know, they talk about it from a perspective of, um, yeah, um, we, need, we don't need to be worried, you know, about Vietnam fighting against Vietnam, but also... The United States treating the people in Vietnam, connecting that struggle back to how black people were treated in America, right? So the fight and understanding the fight of always being against these same people. And in both Malcolm X's case and Martin Luther King's case, which draw back to my main point, is Mark, Malcolm X and Martin Luther King both talk about black and white, liberals, moderates, bunches, right? They talk about him, right? In this letter from Birmingham jail, specifically, Martin Luther King talks about, um, you know, sometimes he feels like the white moderate. And he goes into black moderates, you know, as well. How he feels sometimes that that's the, the biggest obstacle. Um, or like the, we're fighting them almost more than we're fighting um, the KKK, right? And, you know, to a certain extent, that's, that's true. Like I said, it has always been an issue between those who were radical and those who were liberal, right? And when you look at liberal and you look at radical, you always have to look at their perspective from anti-colonialism, anti-capitalism, or anti-imperialism. 
Those are the radical frameworks that got people attacked. And that's what I want everybody to remember. Not, integrate, uh, not integration versus separation. It was how radical is your agenda with regard to anti-capitalism, with regard to anti-imperialism, and with regard to fighting for, you could say, the human rights or civil rights, but definitely human rights overall, internationalizing the issues, that was the point of contention.